Oui, bonsoir, euh, bonsoir tout le monde. Je suis ravie de, de vous revoir pour certains et je salue tous ceux, ceux nouveaux venants qui sont venus pour la première fois dans ce cadre de, de notre cycle de séminaire patrimoine spolié pendant la période du nazisme. Donc, euh, merci d'être venu parce que je sais que c'est pas évident avec les temps qui courent entre le virus qui traîne quelque part dans l'air et en plus avec ce très mauvais temps. Donc, euh, vraiment, je suis ravie de vous voir une fois de plus aussi nombreux. Donc, euh, ce soir, on va avoir une conférence euh, de la part de Christina Feichenfeld, que je vais vous présenter dans, dans, dans quelques, quelques instants. Euh, ce qui était prévu, ce qui était annoncé dans le programme, c'était éventuellement, c'est aussi un dialogue avec Walter Feichenfeld, qui est également présent euh, et en fait qui va nous, rejoindre, nous, nous, nous retrouver pour le dialogue hein, après la présentation de Christina. Donc, euh, dans un premier temps, c'est Christina qui va vous présenter donc, l'histoire de cette galerie extrêmement euh, importante et, et fameuse pour l'art moderne, donc, qui a été créée à la fin du 19e siècle à Berlin, la galerie Cassirer, et qui était vraiment là, à l'adresse, euh, en tout cas en Allemagne, pour l'art moderne, grand porte-parole, enfin euh, marchand pour l'art français, euh, qui a fait connaître l'art français, notamment les impressionnistes, euh, mais aussi également l'art moderne allemand avant-gardiste euh, à partir donc, du début du siècle. Donc euh, elle va nous donner certainement une aperçu de, de, de cette, ces années absolument fondatrices de, du but de la galerie. Mais comme vous pouvez imaginer, ce qui nous intéresse beaucoup aujourd'hui, c'est aussi le sort, l'histoire de, de la galerie qui, qui était en fait dirigée à partir de la fin des années 20 euh, par euh, Walter Feichenfeld Senior, entre autres, avec d'autres, d'autres collègues. Euh, donc on est vraiment face à une histoire familiale euh, très complexe et très très riche. Et bien sûr, à partir de, des années 30, 33, donc, euh, c'était, c'était l'exil pour euh, tous les, les, notamment les deux dirigeants de la galerie. Et donc, Christina va vous pré- nous présenter donc, l'histoire euh, très complexe de ces années-là. Aussi, euh, un sujet qui va, j'espère, ouvrir un débat euh, sur les questions de ce qu'on appelle aujourd'hui parfois les ventes forcées. Alors, en allemand, on fait cette distinction euh, entre la Fluchtkunst et la Raubkunst, donc, c'est-à-dire une distinction euh, par rapport à l'art qui a été vraiment spolié, principalement bien sûr, comme vous le savez tous, pendant les années de la guerre euh, par les nazis, et l'art qui a permis la fuite, qui a permis en fait euh, euh, à beaucoup de familles euh, collectionneurs, euh, familles juives euh, bien sûr dans un premier temps, mais aussi euh, d'autres porte parole de, de l'art moderne contemporain, à, à quitter l'Allemagne nazie et parfois aussi à sauver en fait euh, cet art qui était menacé, comme vous le savez tous, euh, à partir du moment surtout si ça a été déclaré comme dégénéré par les nazis, donc qui a permis en fait à sauver aussi cet art. Donc euh, ça c'est un débat qui, euh, j'espère qu'on aura le temps à la fin de la conférence euh, de, de discuter avec vous sur ces questions, comme vous le savez, euh, euh, du point de vue de la recherche provenance, il y, a un, il y a un débat qui est ouvert. En Allemagne, maintenant, on est en train de réfléchir, de, 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 de considérer en fait tout art vendu, acheté, trans, transféré, si vous voulez, entre 33 et 45, euh, devrait être questionné. Il faudrait, il faudrait réfléchir si, si on exige une restitution ou pas. Donc euh, ça va être très, très passionnant, je pense, que d'avoir le point de vue d'une famille qui était directement concernée, à la fois en tant que euh, victime, mais aussi en tant, que, en tant que grand marchand. Voilà, je vous présente en, en, en quelques mots euh, Christina. Alors, je voulais dire, euh, Christina parle parfaitement français, mais elle a préféré ce soir de, de faire sa présentation en anglais, donc je, je pense que ça ne posera pas de problème. Mais de toute façon, pendant la discussion, euh, bon, on va soit traduire euh, les questions, mais comme vous le savez, c'est tout à fait possible en français, euh, allemand, comme vous voulez. Peut-être pas chinois, ça serait difficile. Donc, euh, Christina Feichenfeld, elle a, elle a étudié l'histoire de l'art euh, à Berlin, l'histoire de l'art, mais également aussi des études de littérature et culture italienne. Elle a passé plusieurs séjours en Italie et elle a travaillé euh, pendant assez longtemps. Là, aujourd'hui, on n'a pas parlé. À, chez Sassobis, à New York et Londres, c'est une longue période Trois, trois ans. Oui, pendant à peu près trois ans, euh, chez Sassobis, à Londres et à New York. Elle vit à Berlin, elle est actuellement euh, historienne de l'art freelance, elle fait beaucoup de recherches de provenance également, et surtout, euh, ce qui nous, nous intéresse ce soir, elle, elle gère, avec, donc ensemble, avec son père Walter, euh, 
les archives de la galerie Cassirer qui sont, qui sont à Zurich. Et qu'est-ce que je peux vous dire d'autre Oui, donc principalement concernant la recherche de provenance et ces recherches actuelles portent beaucoup sur les différentes collectionneurs, les différents clients en fait de la, de la galerie Cassira. Voilà, elle a participé à divers et nombreux ateliers de travail, des workshops, elle a beaucoup publié, principalement des articles sur, sur l'histoire, en lien avec l'histoire de la galerie Cassira, mais pas seulement. Donc voilà, donc je suis ravie euh, qu'elle soit avec nous ce soir et, et on, est, on, est, on est ravis de, 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 de t'entendre. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci. C'est normal. 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 Merci Inès. Et bonsoir à tous. Um, oui, je vais parler en anglais. J'espère que ça va. Um, in 1898, the cousins Paul and Bruno Cassira founded their gallery and publishing house at Victoria Strasse 35 in Berlin Tiergarten a fashionable area of the German capital. Henry van der Felder had designed the elegant premises, which were to become one of the most important addresses to see works by French artists of the 19th century outside of France. From the beginning, the gallery program was a presentation of French art, mainly Impressionism, in Berlin on the one side and the promotion of the artists of the Berlin Secession on the other such as Max Liebermann, Max Lefogt, Lovis Corinth, Walter Leistikow, and many others. The Berlin Secession was founded the same year, on 2nd May 1898, with the painter Max Liebermann as president and Paul Cassira as secretary, which affected the unusual exhibition concept of the gallery, mostly combining stylistically very different artists. The very first exhibition, from 1st November to 1st December 1898, for example, presented 55 paintings and drawings by Max Liebermann, 27 paintings, drawings and pastels by Edgar Degas, and 13 sculptures by the Belgian Constantine Meunier. Van der Felder's tasteful interior in combination with the spacious presentation of the artworks was commented on by most art critics emphasizing the viewing experience in the newly opened gallery space as being of special sophistication and for a distinguished public. In the six volumes documenting the exhibitions at the Paul Cassira Gallery until 1914, which were published from 2011 until 2016, Bernhard Echte based his research on the remaining exhibition catalogues in the Cassira archive in Zurich and in other libraries, which he completed by adding critics from daily Berlin um, newspapers of the time. He managed to assemble an amazing compilation of information, giving an extended overview of the achievements of the Cassira Gallery, which was unique at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, and brought French Impressionism against all odds and particularly against the ex explicit will of Kaiser Wilhelm II to Germany. At this time, there were more works by French Impressionists in German collections than in France, and the most important dealers for these works, Joss and Gaston Bernheim Jeune and Paul Durand Ruel, chose Paul Cassira as their partner in order to show these paintings in, a Germ in the German capital. About 83 Cassira exhibition catalogues have survived the war and are now in the Zurich Paul Cassira and Walter Feichenfeld archive. The complete information on the archive is listed on the website. In the late 1930s, the business records, including exhibition and auction catalogues, photographs, stock books, and stock cards, correspondence, and the Cassira Library were shipped to the Amsterdam branch of the gallery, which was founded in 1923 and managed by the German art historian, Dr. Helmut Lütjens, until his death in 1986. Paul Cassira Amsterdam was closed in 2011. For only five years, a second branch in Germany had been opened in Hamburg in 1901 at Jungfernstieg 16, but after moving to a smaller space at Jungfernstieg number 12, 
The Hamburg showrooms were closed in 1906. The documents kept in the Paul Cassirer and Walter Feichenfeld archive today survived World War II in Holland and, when, and were then brought to Switzerland. An additional great source of information in our archive is the correspondence and the shipping lists between the Berlin Gallery Paul Cassira and the Gallery Durand Ruel in Paris. The shipping lists from the archive of the Gallery Durand Ruel, cordially shared with us by, by Flavie Durand Ruel, Paul Durand Ruel's great great granddaughter, and the dealer's great grandson, Paul Louis Durand Ruel, add many pieces to the puzzle and can in some cases complete the information on the early provenance or exhibition history of a work shown at the Paul Cassira Gallery in Berlin. According to the Durand Ruel shipping list, Monet's Soleil Levant was shown in Berlin in 1899. It had been sent to Berlin with the Durand Ruel inventory number 2265 as Soleil dans le Brouillard on 3rd January 1899 and was returned to Paris on 25th April the same year where it was sold through Durand Ruel. The information regarding the shipments of works of art between Paris and Berlin, which we received from the Durand Ruel Gallery together with copies of the correspondence between the Paul Cassira and Paul Durand Ruel, uh, of, um, of correspondence between Paul Cassira and Paul, Paul Durand Ruel, is even more valuable to the Paul Cassira archive as the gallery's folders of correspondence have not survived World War II. Helmut Lütjens burned them during the war in Amsterdam, fearing the German invasion of Holland and trying to guard the safety of the Cassira collectors, many of which had been forced to leave Germany after 1933. Probably the first letter ever written by Paul Cassira to Paul Durand Ruel is dated 9th October 1898, seeking to establish a working relationship between the two galleries. On 14th December the same year, Paul and Bruno wrote to Paul Durand Ruel again. Quote, Comme Monsieur Lieberman nous a dit, vous êtes encore propriétaire de 10 tableaux de Manet. Nous savons bien qu'il serait un sacrifice énorme si vous nous donneriez ces tableaux pour quelques semaines en dépôt, mais c'est notre plus vif désir de pouvoir faire une exposition de Manet que nous vous adressons tout de même cette demande. Une exposition de Manet serait un événement artistique pour l'Allemagne d'une importance inouïe. Nous sommes sûrs que tous les artistes et tous les amateurs de l'Allemagne vous seraient gracieux pour ce sacrifice que vous faites pour l'art. En outre, nous croyons que cette exposition poussera le succès de l'art français très loin, que tout Berlin aimera l'art français après cette exposition. Nous sommes même sûrs de vendre un ou deux manets, mais nous savons bien que tout cela ne peut pas vous tenter, que vous pouvez vendre vos manets partout. C'est seulement dans l'idée que cette exposition fera tant de bien à nos artistes et que vous avez déjà tant fait pour l'art, sans regarder votre intérêt matériel, que nous espérons à votre consentement. End of quote. This early document is a testimony of the goals the Cassira sought to reach by exhibiting French art in Berlin. Coming from a wealthy background, it was not mainly a material interest at first, but as they write in the quoted letter, they aimed to bring French art to Berlin and introduce it to tout Berlin and tous les artistes et tous les amateurs de l'Allemagne vous serez gracieux. At this point, not only the Kaiser and the German public, but also many German artists were still skeptical and hostile against modern French art with the big escalation in the so-called Finnen fight in 1911. The reason for this outcry of German artists against the import of foreign, but mainly French works of art was the acquisition of Van Gogh's Le Champ de Coquelicot for 30,000 marks from Paul Cassira by the Kunsthalle Bremen at the first, as the first museum to buy a painting by Van Gogh. As a result of this, by the German public considered outrageous price for a foreign work of art, the painter Karl Finnen published his protest of German artists in March 1911, which was signed by 140 painters and sculptors. As a counterstatement, 47 artists, amongst them Max Liebermann, Max Beckmann, Vasily Kandinsky, 
but also art dealers such as Kassira and Flechtheim published a reply and Paul Kassira made a statement of his own with the title Art and Art Dealing, which he published in the art periodical Pan on 16th May 1911. In an extensive essay, he explains the difference of trading wheat, for example, to trading art, as importing wheat from abroad would reduce the, the German wheat price. The import of foreign pictures, however, could most likely have the opposite effect on prices paid for German art, which he seeks to explain. At the end of this very eloquent and intelligent essay, Kassira puts his aim why he chose to deal with French and not with German art into words. Quote, why was I to speculate with French pictures? I will give you the answer. Because I considered the introduction of French art to Germany a cultural act. And this also is not the real reason. Simply because I loved money, because I considered Monet, Sisley and Pissarro to be strong artists, because I thought Daumier and Renoir to be geniuses, Degas to be one of the biggest masters, and Cézanne, the bearer of a world view. End of quote. <clears throat> the painter Max Liebermann, who played an important role for Paul Cassira as an artist and as a collector, had visited the French capital in June 1896 together with the newly appointed director of the Berlin National Gallery, Hugo von Schudi. In the gallery Durand Ruel, they saw Manet's Dans la Serre, which was presented as a gift of the so-called Berlin art friends Eduard Arnold, Ernst and Robert von Mendelssohn and Hugo von Oppenheim to the National Gallery the same year on Tschudi's behalf. A year later, Tschudi acquired the first painting by Cézanne to be shown in a museum, Le Moulin sur la Couleuvre à Pontoise. These two acquisitions made the Berlin National Gallery the first museum to show works of French Impressionist artists. Before, these were shown in any other public collection in France or elsewhere. Liebermann and Schudi must have seen other paintings by Manet at durand Ruel during the, their visit to Paris and reported this to the Cassiras, as quoted in the letter above. We do not have durand Ruel's answer to Cassiras' request in our archive, but six paintings by Manet are mentioned by the critics to have been in the second exhibition at Paul and Bruno Cassira in 1899. Le Vieux Musicien, or Le Musicien Ambulant, was shipped to Berlin on 3rd January 1899 and rendu to Durand Ruel on 25th April the same year. Durand Ruel sold the painting to the Prince de Wagram. It was later owned by the American collector Chester Dale, who gave it to the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Portrait de Pertusé en Chasse de Lyon was also shown in Berlin but according to the Durand-Ruel shipping list, it equally returned to Paris on 25th April. The painting was, however, eventually part of the collection of Ludwig Katzen Ellenbogen in Berlin. His son Konrad, who changed his name to Konrad Kellen after his emigration to America, sold it with the German-born American art dealer Frank Pels to the Museo de Arte Moderna in Sao Paulo. From 15th October to 1st December 1899, the Cassiras showed 17 paintings by Edouard Manet, 17 paintings and works on paper by Edgar Degas, 15 works by Puvis de Chavannes, and 35 paintings by the Berlin secession artist Max Lefogt. Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe was exhibited with the catalogue number two. The painting is listed in Cassiras' books by 8th September 1899 and then returned to Paris on 8th January 1900. Manet's La Maison de Rueil, was, which had been sent to Berlin by Pont Durand Ruel a couple of months earlier, on 10th May 1899, remained in the German capital. It was acquired by the collector Karl Hagen on 29th December the same year, who gave it to the National Gallery in 1906. During the years leading up to the outbreak of World War I, a highly productive exchange of paintings took place between Paris and Berlin, with Cassira frequently sending a painting back and later requiring it a second or third time for a new exhibition, if it had not been sold in the meantime. For example, Claude Monet's Waterloo Bridge, Ton Gris of 1903, present whereabouts unknown according to the catalogue resume. 
This painting was sent to Berlin on 24th February 1906 and returned to Durand Ruel on 28th December 1907. On 18th October 1909, it was shipped to Berlin again and sold on 20th April 1914, just before the outbreak of World War I, which terminated the business relationship between the two galleries until 1924. Apart from Bernheim Jeune and Durand Ruel, it was also Ambroise Vollard that Cassiras worked with closely, especially by bringing the work of Paul Cézanne to Germany. <clears throat> we do not have any documents apart from the stock book entries regarding the transactions between the Cassira Gallery and Bernheim Jeune or Vollard in our archive in Zurich. In the Vollard archive in the Musée d'Orsay, however, there is information regarding the dealer's transactions with Cassira in Berlin. The cousins had shown Cézanne in their gallery the for the first time in Germany in November 1900. According to the correspondence with Durand Ruel, they received a collection de Cézanne in October 1900 and returned the 12 works on 14th December. These were the works Durand Ruel had purchased at the Choquet sale in 1899. Cézanne was shown again in a larger exhibition dedicated exclusively to his work from 22nd April to 15th June in 1904. We do not have a catalogue of this exhibition, but 30 paintings, such as the card players today in the Metropolitan Museum, are mentioned by the critics, most of which consider Cézanne at this point already as one of the great masters, next to Manet and Monet. Les Pêcheurs, Journée de Juillet, was sent to Berlin by Bernheim Jeune and owned by Paul Cassira by 1907, who sold it to Max Liebermann in 1909. Hugo von Schudi had been forbidden to buy the painting for the National Gallery by verdict of the Kaiser. La Corbeille de Pomme was acquired by Max Linde from Lübeck from the same exhibition. But not only the works, for the works of Cézanne did the Cassiras create a market in Germany. Vincent van Gogh was a second artist whose works were shown repeatedly in the Cassira Gallery until the outbreak of World War I, and then once more in 1928. Van Gogh was exhibited for the first time at Victoria Strasse 35 in the winter of 1901 to 1902, when Karl Ernst Osthaus from Hagen as the first German collector acquired a small landscape, Harvest, La Moisson of 1889. By 1904, Van Gogh's works had been acquired next to Osthaus by collectors such as Hugo von Schudi, Harry Count Kessler, and Julius Meyer Griefe. From 22nd November until 17th December 1904, Cassira dedicated the largest of his three showrooms to Van Gogh and showed 43 of his works. Though not a single painting was sold, Cassira wrote to Johanna Van Gogh Bonger, the wife of the artist's brother Theo, the following year seeking to establish a business relationship. In 1905, she agreed to a contract according to which Paul Cassira and Johanna van Gogh would work closely together in the future. In April 1905, she sent 30 paintings to Berlin for a first exhibition of her holdings. Robert von Mendelssohn bought wheat field with peasant, Julius Stern, olive picking, and Eduard Mountner, the rocks only to name a number of early German collectors of Van Gogh's work. Hugo von Schudi acquired a version of the sunflowers on blue background from this exhibition, which he took to Munich with him after he was dismissed from his post at the National Gallery by the Kaiser in 1908. Wilhelm II had vetoed the acquisition of the sunflowers, which had led to increasing discrepancies with Schudi and his transition to the Pinakothek in Munich. Paul Cassira continued to exhibit Van Gogh's art 10 times until 1914, when he assembled 151 works in one exhibition from 30th May to 5th July. Only 25 pictures were for sale. All the others were on loan from Johanna Van Gogh and her son, Vincent Willem, as well as from German and Austrian collectors. Many Impressionist paintings sent from Paris found buyers in Berlin and other German cities, such as Breslau or Hamburg where mainly Jewish clients formed significant collections of French Impressionist art at the beginning of the 20th century, leading up to World War II. 
Hugo Simon, who was an important businessman in the Weimar Republic and whose tragic story of emigration and loss was reported to you last year by his great-grandson, Raphael Cardoso, here at INHR, was one of them. Max Liebermann, Jakob Goldschmidt, Eduard Arnold, Ludwig and Estella Katzen-Ellenbogen, Max Silberberg, Leo Levin, and many others started to buy Impressionist art at the Cassira Gallery. In 1901, the cousins separated the business. Bruno took over the publishing house and Paul continued to run the gallery, first on his own and later with my grandfather, Dr. Walter Falchenfeld, and the art historian, Dr. Greta Ring. Walter Falchenfeld had joined the Paul Cassira publishing house in 1919 and made his transition to the gallery in 1922. In 1924, Falchenfeld and Greta Ring became partners after successful negotiations with the French business partners Durand Ruel and Bernheim Jeune. These had been necessary as a consequence of a difficult business situation between the French partners and Cassira during the war years. In her memoirs, published in 1971, Paul Cassira's wife, the actress Tilla Durieux, gives a detailed account of the events. In the summer of 1914, she traveled with her husband by car via Belgium to Paris, where Cassira had requested from the aged Renoir to paint his wife's portrait. He had known Renoir for many years and had shown his paintings in his gallery in Berlin. Tiller describes the sessions and conversations with Renoir during the fortnight in July 1914 until her portrait is finished. Then, she reports, one afternoon Cassira's chauffeur appears and suggests they leave Paris as most other foreign cars from the garage at the Hotel Mirabeau, where they are staying, have already left. War lies in the air. The painting, however, has to be left behind to dry. Cassira reassures his wife that he has sent Paul Durand-Ruel Durand a telegram requesting him to take care of the portrait until it is ready for transport. Most of all, Cassira was concerned about the money collection from Auguste Pellerin, the case of war, which she had acquired together with Durand-Ruel and Bernheim Jeune in 1910. In the summer of 1914, many of these works were stored in Berlin. Among them, Déjeuner dans l'atelier, Bar aux folies bergères, and Nana. As the second sale book covering the Cassira sales from 2nd May 1910 until April 1915 was destroyed in London in World War II, we do not have a complete record of the sales during the war years. However, on 10th March 1910, Hugo Cassira acquired monies or skating from the Pellerin collection for 35,000 mark. And Robert von Mendelssohn bought Femme à la fourrure au fond vert for 22,500 francs. According to the stock books, Manet's Bar of Folie Bergère was sold to Ferenc von Hatfani during the war on 20th April 1916 for 200,000 marks. Hatfani was a highly successful sugar merchant and collector of impressionist art of Jewish descent, who lived in Budapest and had been educated in Berlin. Hatfani managed to escape to Switzerland in the 1930s, but his collection was lost in the war. Manis Nana had already been acquired in 1910 by the Hamburg collector Theodor E. Behrens. The painting was on loan from the collector's family from 1919 to 1924 in the Hamburger Kunsthalle, the year the museum acquired it. According to the Durand Ruel shipping list, four as Hamlet from the Pellerin collection was not sold in Berlin in 1910, but was returned to Paris, presumably before 1914, with an asking price of 125,000 francs. Tilla Durieux recalls the route she took in the car with Paul Cassira from Nordweig to Berlin via Düsseldorf on 28th July 1914, where he tried to place a phone call in order to discuss with Durand Ruel what should happen with their shared paintings in case of war. But the phone call was interrupted by order of the state and on 3rd August war was declared between Germany and France. At this point, Cassira, even though he was already 45 years old, decided to join the forces. 
He left the Berlin business in the hands of the authorized officer Storperan, as he did not expect any works of art to be sold during the war years. This, however, turned out to be a mistake. There was interest for the Pellerin paintings in Berlin, but it was not clear if the gallery had the right to sell during the war, as the paintings were partly in French possession. Durieux reports that it was agreed that a Swiss unnamed dealer presented a request to Cassira's French business partners and that they consented to sales in Berlin if the money was transferred to a fiduciary account, which is what then happened. In 1916 and 17, the business started to recover. A number of the Pellerin paintings found buyers and the money was transferred to the fiduciary account. After the war, the galleries Durand Ruel and Bernheim Jeune in Paris did not accept the sales of the Pellerin pictures in Berlin, considering them to be an embezzlement. On top of this, the German mark had fallen in value, which meant their asking price of 12 million francs was out of Cassira's financial range. The document with the written proof of the negotiations between the partners had disappeared, and if the case went to court and Cassira lost, this would have meant the end of his business. However, the letter was found eventually and a court case could be prevented, but Paul Cassira was not received in Paris any longer by his former business partners. In this situation, Walter Feitenfeld, who spoke French fluently, offered to take over the negotiations on condition that would both parties come to an agreement, he and Greta Ring would become partners, which is what happened in 1924. They both took over the firm together after Paul Cassira's death in 1926 and continued the business in Berlin until 1933. Since 1916, Oskar Kokoschka was an artist of the gallery whose work now was frequently exhibited there. Next to Max Liebermann, August Gaul and Ernst Barlach, he was one of the very few Cassira supplied with exclusive conditions and a contract. After 1918, the gallery focus shifted to auctioneering and selling the works from Berlin collections, which became increasingly important as the global economic crisis started to unfold during the 1920s. The first auction to be conducted at the Cassira Gallery was the sale of the collection of Julius Stern on 22nd May 1916. Like many other Jewish collectors, Stern had mainly acquired his art from Cassira, who now put his estate up for auction. During the following years, many auctions were to follow. After Cassira's tragic death in 1926, he committed suicide after his wife Tilla Durieux wanted a divorce, Feitenfeld and Greta Ring continued the business successfully and carried out most auctions in cooperation with the Munich auctioneer Hugo Helbing. The auction of the collection of Oskar Hulczynski during two days in May 1928 put the gallery on the map internationally. It was held in the ballroom of the elegant Hotel Esplanade in Berlin and was accompanied by a beautiful and very expensively produced large and heavy catalogue anticipating the coffee table book of today. 243 lots were sold. The last exhibition in the Paul Cassira Gallery was held in March 1933. The last and 82nd auction was the sale of the estate of the painter Lesser Uri on 21st October 1932. The annotated auction catalogues, which could be saved during World War II in Holland and which are now part of the Cassira archive in Zurich, are currently being scanned at the University in Heidelberg and will be part of the public provenance research tool Heidi, Katalog für die Bibliotheken der Universität Heidelberg. After 1933, when the National Socialists came to power, business started to become increasingly difficult. In 1935, Greta Ring transformed the business, the Berlin business, into a single member company and finally liquidated it in 1937. She emigrated to England the same year and founded Paul Cassira Limited in London in 1938. Walter Feitenfeld had left Berlin already in 1933 to conduct his business from the Amsterdam Cassira branch. From there, he began to plan the art transfer for his German, mostly Jewish clients who were beginning to organize their immigration from Germany. The exhibition of French 19th century art from 14th May to 6th August 1933 
at the Zurich Kunsthaus offered the opportunity to ship many of these works from Germany to Switzerland on a temporary export license, and therefore avoiding the taxes a permanent export out of the country would have meant. Of the 37 paintings Walter Falschenfeld sent to Switzerland in March 1933, 14 belonged to the group of 80 paintings and drawings he had acquired en bloc in 1929 from the estate of Paul Gallimard, who had died on 9th March in Paris that year. The collection comprised many masterpieces from Bonnard to Zurbaran, but the most important being the large format Le Linge by Edouard Manet. Feichenfeld had financed the acquisition by taking on a loan of 500,000 gold mark at the Rodius Königsbank in Amsterdam. The vendors had requested not to start selling the paintings before 1930 for tax reasons. But as the stock market crashed in October 1929, Feichenfeld was no longer in a position to find buyers for most of these works, which left him financially in a critical situation. The American collector Albert Barnes acquired Le Linge in 1935 below cost. Under today's standards, one would say Feichenfeld sold it under duress. The painting is now in the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. The remaining 23 paintings in the Zurich exhibition belong to Jewish collectors of the gallery, such as Estella Katzen-Ellenbogen, Tilla Durieu, Bruno Cassira, and Max Liebermann. Liebermann had played a very important role since the early days of the existence of the gallery. Not only were nearly all of his numerous paintings and drawings sold through Cassira, around 2,240 paintings and works on paper. He was also a significant collector of Impressionist art, and his wife Martha was a cousin of Greta Ring. Falchenfeld transferred the 14 most important works of his collection to Switzerland on initiative of the Swiss banker and benefactor of the Zurich Kunsthaus, Adolf Jür. These paintings were stored as a so-called Depot Liebermann Rietzler in the museum and had been insured with the sum of 400,000 Reichsmark. During the following years, the Kunsthaus became a refuge for many works of art belonging to Jewish collectors. The extensive correspondence between the director of the museum, Dr. Wilhelm Wartmann, and many emigrants seeking to store or sell their art in Zurich is kept in the library of the museum and is an important source of information regarding the art market during the 1930s. By sending his clients' artworks out of the country on various exhibitions, a part of them had already been shown in the Neue Galerie in Vienna from February to March 1933, Walter Feichenfeld managed to save them from seizure by the Nazi government in Germany. In some cases, the owners decided to leave their works at the Zurich Kunsthaus or to sell them straight away. In most cases, however, Feichenfeld sent them on to the Paul Cassira Gallery in Amsterdam, where they were stored during the war years or sent on to their rightful owners. A selection was also shown in the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam from December 1933, to January 1934 in the exhibition Schildereien van Delacroix tot Cézanne and Vincent van Gogh before returning to Switzerland, or in the exhibition Französische Meister des 19. Jahrhunderts und van Gogh at the Kunsthalle in Bern from February to April 1934. Among these paintings was van Gogh's railway bridge over Avenue Montmajour with the catalogue number 62 in Bern. It belonged to the writer Erich Maria Remarque, who had started to buy Impressionist art at the Cassira Gallery after the success of, the, of his anti-war novel, All Quiet on the Western Front. Falchenfeld saved a number of his artworks in the safe of Paul Cassira Limited in London, before shipping them to Remarque in New York in 1939, just be before the beginning of World War II. Of the 14 pictures of the Depot Liebermann Rietzler, Manet's roses, tulips, tulip et lila blanc, dans un vase de cristal, bouquet de pivoine, de gaz danseuse avec une, cha une chaise, and Renoir's fleur de printemps dans la serre were shown in the 1933 exhibition in Zurich. The Depot book gives exact information of when the artworks arrived in Zurich and when and where they were sent on to. Degas' dancers left Zurich for Paul Cassira Amsterdam on 29th December 38. 
Kurt Rietzler sold the painting through the Nödler Gallery in New York to the Wordsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. Cezanne's Friday, Summer Sunday, came to Zurich on 19th August 36 from the Kunsthalle Basel. It was sent to the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam on 22nd June 38. The painting was given to the Metropolitan Museum in New York in 2001 by Liebermann's great-granddaughters Heather Daniels and Catherine Wilde. Daumier's painter was sent to the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam on 22nd June 38. It was later handled by André Weil in Paris and the Nödler Gallery in New York, who sold it to Robert Sterling Clark in 1954. The painting is in the Clark Institute in Williamstown since 1955. Degas' frieze of dancers was sent to the Musée National in Paris on 23rd February 37. From there it went on 29th December 38 to Paul Cassira, Amsterdam. Kurt Rietzler sold the painting to the Cleveland Museum of Art in 1946. Degas' dancers with chair were also sent to the Musée National in Paris on 23rd February 37 and from there on 29th December 38 to Paul Cassira, Amsterdam. This picture is in a private collection. This painting was listed as Les Marmonniers in the Depot book and was stored at the Kunsthalle Basel from 19th August 36 to 20th October 36. After that, it was in Zurich until its transport to the Stedelijk Museum on 24th January 38. Kurt Rietzler sold the painting to the National Gallery of Canada in 1954, shortly before his death the same year. His wife, Max and Martha Liebermann's daughter, Käthe and Käthe, his wife, Max and Martha Liebermann's daughter, Käthe, had died two years earlier. Jean de Cours, Horace à Auteuil, was shipped on 24th January 38 to the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. The painting was sold by Kurt Rietzler to the Cincinnati Art Museum in 1944. Portrait de Madame Manet à Bellevue was shipped on, 21st, on 24th January 38 to the Stedelijk Museum. The family sold it in New York. Since 1997, the painting is on view in the Metropolitan Museum that owns it since 2002. Portrait de Georges Moore was shipped on 29th December 38 to Paul Cassira, Amsterdam. Kurt Rietzler sold it through the Wildenstein Galleries in New York to Paul Mellon, who left it to the National Gallery in Washington. Rose, Tulip et Lila Blanc dans un vase de cristal was transported to the Stedelijk Museum on 24th January 38. It belonged to the family until 2001 when Walter Falchenfeld Jr. sold it to a private collector. Bouquet de Pivoine was shipped to Paul Cassira, Amsterdam on 29th December 38. It was in the family's collection until 1990 when it was put up for auction. Une botte d'asperge was sent to the Stedelijk Museum on 22nd June 38 and sold through Marianne Feilchenfeld to the Walraff Richards Museum in Cologne in 1976. Monet's Moulin Près de saint dame was shipped to Cassira, Amsterdam on 29th December 38. The painting was sold in New York by the family in the 1950s. And, and finally, Renoir's Fleur de Printemps dans la Serre left Zurich on 24th January 38 without note of destination, but probably also to Paul Cassira, Amsterdam. It was sold through Marianne Feitenfeld in, in 1958 to the Hamburger Kunsthalle. Most of these paintings were shipped to the Paul Cassira Gallery in Amsterdam and then sent from there to Max and Martha Liebermann's daughter and son-in-law, Käthe and Kurt Rietzler in New York before 1939. The Rietzlers had emigrated from Berlin with their daughter Maria in 1938. But unfortunately, Martha Liebermann could not be convinced to leave Germany with her family after the death of her husband three years before. When she did try to leave the country in 1941, it was too late, and even though Walter Falchenfeld and the Swiss collector Oskar Reinhardt tried to rescue the old lady and bring her to Switzerland, the Nazi government prevented her emigration, first to Switzerland and then to Sweden. Before she was to be deported to Theresienstadt on 5th March 1943, 
Martha Liebermann took the poison Veronal at the age of 86 and died several days later in the Jewish hospital in Berlin. Keta and Kurt Rietzler and their daughter Maria, as many other Jewish collectors of the Kassira Gallery, came back after the war and continued to sell artworks through Walter and later Marianne Feitenfeld. In 1946, Walter Feitenfeld had received the Swiss work permit and was allowed to conduct his business from the newly founded gallery in 1948 in Zurich. After his early death in 1953, his wife Marianne continued the business very successfully. In 1966, Walter Feichenfeld Jr., my father, joined the firm and transformed it after many fruitful years in art dealing to a company of trading and research in 2012. Today, the firm consists of Walter Feichenfeld, our employee of many years, Petra Cordioli and myself, and has become an important source of provenance research and documentation. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Christina, pour ce, cette présentation très dense et, et, et passionnante. Donc, euh, attends, est-ce que j'ai allumé On m'entend Oui, je pense. Euh, bon, on va essayer de, de commencer une petite discussion en français, en anglais, euh, comme vous voulez, poser des questions aussi. Il y a deux micros dans la salle qui vont circuler. Mais peut-être pour commencer, oui, donc... Je, je parle un petit peu en français, et après peut-être qu'il peut répondre en anglais et on va faire la traduction s'il si, si, si le faut. Euh, oui, c'était très très dense, alors je ne sais pas si tout le monde a pu suivre toutes les étapes. C'est vraiment une histoire passionnante de cette, de cette galerie euh, si importante. Euh, peut-être, moi j'avais une première question concernant... Euh, tu avais montré... Une image euh, avec une erreur dans le catalogue Wildenstein. Weißt du, das Bild mit dem blauen Blumen, wo du sagtest, es habe eine, eine falsche Information. Est-ce yeah, que yeah, tu peux juste reculer? Yeah. Ça, yeah. Tu peux juste expliquer, vielleicht noch einmal, maybe you can just explain another, because I actually I didn't get really the, the wrong inscription, what, what happened to the catalogue. Um, it's basically just a, a, a wrong information on the description. It's Lila Blanc and not Lila oh, Bleu. Okay. That, it's that's just the that's title. Only, yeah, all right. That's okay, all. that was just a little, <laughs> little detail. Okay. Um, so, yeah, maybe before actually, um, alors juste avant de commencer la discussion entre entre Walter et Christina et surtout le public, je vais dire quand même deux mots pour par rapport à. Vous présentez Walter Feichenfeld lui-même, donc euh, vous avez entendu, Christine en a déjà parlé, il a, il a pris le relais en fait euh, du travail de, de son père, dans un premier temps après le décès donc, de, de son père en 56, c'est ça, 56, il c'était d'abord Marianne Breslauer, donc l'épouse de Walter Feichenfeld Senior qui, qui a pris le relais, et toi tu as rejoint la galerie dans les années 60 c'est ça 66. 66, tout à fait. Donc euh, voilà, donc Walter Feichenfeld qui est à côté de moi, il est, il est bon, grand marchand de cette, cette galerie. Il est aussi expert donc, par la suite, dans un premier temps, donc, euh, très actif euh, après des études d'ailleurs d'économie en tant que marchand. Il s'est lancé en fait, dans, dans, dans la recherche euh, scientifique en histoire de l'art. Et il est à nos jours un des grands experts, notamment de, du peintre Cézanne et Van Gogh, hein, donc auteur de, du catalogue raisonné. Et tout récemment, en coopération avec deux autres experts concernant Cézanne aussi, l'auteur de cette magnifique, ce magnifique catalogue raisonné qui est online, qui est en ligne, euh, consultable. Donc, euh, on ne va pas le montrer là, mais c'est facilement à, à, à trouver. Euh, donc, à la suite de ces nombreuses publications. Et toujours à Zurich, depuis 
depuis ta naissance, si j'ai bien compris. Euh, oui, alors, vielleicht, peut-être une première question euh, pour lancer le débat. Donc, tu as, tu as expliqué, Christina, en fait, que... À partir de 33, ton, ton grand-père, il, il part en immigration, il part en exil, dans un premier temps à Amsterdam, et ensuite, euh, il, il arrivera à Zurich avec la galerie, donc il est maintenu à Amsterdam. Euh, comment on peut imaginer, en fait, les activités de ton grand-père à ce moment-là À partir de 33, au niveau du marché, est-ce qu'il peut quand même retourner encore en Allemagne, consulter, voir les, les autres collectionneurs, ses clients, ou est-ce que c'est... Tout, ces, tout ce marché, marché que tu as décrit, en fait, se, se déroule plutôt à partir d'Amsterdam ou même Londres avec Rittering. You don't have to translate. I think. No, it's okay. No, I, I will answer in, in English. Um, he, he emigrated from Germany but, and, and to conduct his business from Amsterdam, but he traveled back and forth a lot. And he traveled to Paris during the war, during the 30s, leading up to the, to the war a lot as well. And... Um, so he try, he took care of the business of his of his clients already trying to organize the transport to switzerland already starting in 1932 his important clients and i listed the lieberman pictures so ex extensively because i also wanted to show that he really did which is something which is being discussed today a lot what the role of the dealers with with the works of their clients one could really see because it's all written in this depot book how he then transported everything to amsterdam and then shipped everything on to his to the to the rieslers to new york before the war broke out unless it had been sold something had been sold in europe and he did that for many of his other clients too like for remark is another example, or Katzen Ellenbogen, there, there there actually is a wrong information in the catalogue raisonné on the chasseur Pertusé or Chasse de Lyon, because that belonged to uh, Katzen Ellenbogen and um, not to Gerstenberg and, and many others, as it, as it is mentioned in the catalogue raisonné. Sorry, I need to get back to that here. So that was a Katzen Ellenbogen picture, which was also sold after the war by, by Conrad Cain, sent to, to America. And, um, and how was it, how was uh, the, it considered right, I mean, after the war, where is there a lot of um, explanation between like the collectors who had to sell actually their works during the 30s, or was it more in a certain respect actually of people like uh, museum people or, or, uh, or dealers who, who were actually there in the 30s and who, who, uh, who agreed to buy. Because there's this huge discussion, especially today, about what is Fluchtkunst, what is Raubkunst, is it a forced sale or not? And I think it is actually important, as you did today, to go back to the sources of the time and to really look on, on the correspondence and on the stock books and how these... Um, transaction uh, somehow happened and I was just, uh, uh, I just remember one uh, c citation by, by another German Jewish immigrant, uh, Paul Westheim, who actually wrote a letter in 1939 to, to Georg Schmidt, who was the director of the, of the Kunsthaus in, in, um, in Basel, and he, he, buy, he bought uh, many, many paintings at the uh, famous Fischer auction. Uh, so where you know, you know, you've heard about this Fischer auction, and it is very interesting to see that actually at the time, the victims as Westheim or maybe even uh, you, your grandfather, he considered these sales as really as an act of a hero. He said, you, you were a hero, it's thanks to your, your, your action, because you, you saved, you really rescued this um, Art, this, uh, this artworks which were condemned, which were uh, we declare degenerate in Germany. So it's thanks to your action, uh, this work, these works survived. So I think it's really inter interesting to see how most of the discussion today looks at, these peri at this period, and is sometimes maybe in a simple way uh, trying to define all what happened between 33 and 45 as a for sale. So I think it's interesting to listen really to this, your experience. So maybe Walter, you can explain your position as, a, as what happened to your family and how do you, how do you see the, this discussion on the Fluchtkunst and the Raubkunst? 
Uh, no, I, I have, I think, <coughs> a rather good example of what happened because in the, in the late 40s, when he had opened his business in Zurich, a portrait by Kokoschka was offered at Sotheby's in London. And my father writes to Greta Ring saying this picture would very much interest him, but only if it becomes from an emigrant family it not if it comes out of Germany, where one wouldn't know who sent it in for sale. So they found out it did come from an, English, from an immigrant family in England, and my father bought it, and he sold it to the uh, Stedelijk Museum in, Am in Amsterdam. It's a portrait of Hauer. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he was very, very careful at the time, and, and he did that, what you call today due diligence. He was c careful not to handle art which possibly was stolen in the war. So everybody was aware of the problem. See very much so. So you personally, you would really distinguish between, you still would distinguish between Fluchkunz and Rabkunz? Oh, definitely, because all these paintings that my father handled, he handled in agreement with the seller. And he found a buyer, and the seller and the buyer would find a price, and the price would be paid. So that's a normal deal as they, as they are done. And what happened after the war? Were there, were there a discussion between like, the fam were there some family, some clients of your father who, for example, came back and said, well, it was a forced sale and could we arrange uh, again or could there be restitution or wasn't it, wasn't it a subject? Absolutely not. All these people who he had looked after during the war came back to him after the war and did business with him. And with me later, like Estella Katzen Ellenbogen or uh, Liebermann family, we, we, I knew them all. I knew the, the daughters and the granddaughters and uh, we did business together and were friendly, very friendly. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Uh, maybe yeah, maybe I would... can just add something to that because we have letters in our archive of Estella Katzen Ellenbogen who emigrated to America and who my grandfather helped to sell her, her pictures. She started an art dealing business of her own. And she constantly writes to him for advice and asks him to help her also to fix a price. And, and, he, and he does. And, and he, she, you know, he, she, uh, he participates at certain sales. And um, he was very helpful to the immigrants later. And, and um, I mean, it's not only the, the, the Liebermann family, not only Kete and, and, and Kurt Rietzler, but also the, the granddaughter. Um, of, of Max Liebermann, who was also very close to my grandmother, and also um, there's a big letter, um, you know, exchange where also my, my grandmother describes or explains the whole situation of with Martha Liebermann and why she was not, why she couldn't leave Germany and that she had killed herself. She didn't know that. The granddaughter didn't know that. So um, there was still a very, you know, a strong rapport between mm. between former clients slash friends. And, and, and my grandparents after the war. And at that time, there was no, no lawyer or no provenance researcher talking or trying to talk to you, and even you, because your family were forced to sell uh, many paintings. It was never a subject to trying to get back uh, uh, paintings which you had to sell at that period? No, it was not. Uh, alors peut-être juste un mot en français, ce que je trouvais très intéressant, ce que tu as évoqué, c'était Willem Wartmann, donc qui était aussi un personnage très important euh, pendant ces années-là, qui était donc le directeur du Kunsthaus Zurich et qui, dès 33, en fait, était très conscient de la problématique, euh, à la fois l'art qui, qui a commencé à être déclaré dégénéré par les nazis et qui a visiblement euh, mis à aider énormément euh, beaucoup d'émigrants à faire sortir en fait leurs œuvres de l'Allemagne nazie. Uh, maybe you could explain a little bit more uh, what was his action and what was his role. You, you mentioned like there were loans which came, which arrived in the museum, like covered loans. How was your relation or the relationship between Wartman and your grandfather at that time? Was there one? Was there one? Well, I mean, my grandfather brought the, the collections of his clients to, 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 yes, there was a close relationship and um, uh, there was a business relationship and it, it worked very well. 
Novartman was, of course, impressed by my father, and he was rather trying to get an international touch for, his, for the Zurich Museum. And, and my father came from Berlin, and he knew everybody, and he gave a lot of feedback for his work. And, and he understood that one had to help these emigrant refugees to get their works out of Germany. And that's why he, why he was prepared to take these, these pictures uh, in storage. And my father had really the brilliant idea first to have them going to Vienna, then to Zurich, and then not back, but to Holland. And then from Holland, they either went to a museum there or they went to Porcasira storage and were sent before the beginning of the war uh, uh, to, to America, most of them, because most, most of the immigrants were able to go to America in time. There's one. I find very, very significant and amusing incident. And this was as my father was in, uh, for October 1939, planning at Paul Cassila, London, a Van Gogh exhibition. And he was very friendly with Kramarski. And Kramarski was, 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 was told, told him that he would give him Dr. Gache at the Jardin de Dubigny for this exhibition in London, which were at the time in storage in, London, in Amsterdam with my fa father. And the idea was that these pictures would be sent straight away to London, which was done in August of 39. And they were in time in London before the war broke out. Of course, they couldn't be, uh, the exhibition couldn't be done, but the pictures were in London and could be sent to New York. That was great luck for for, for Kowalski, it was thanks to an exhibition that didn't take place. But that's how these people worked together, with great trust and with, with a sort of a common interest for that everybody was doing well. Maybe we could talk about another example, which would be an example of the, one of the artists who were concerned of this uh, political uh, circumstance. You, you mentioned uh, Kokoschka, who was also a main artist for your for your gallery. Uh, of course, I think most of you know that Kokoschka immigrated in 34. Uh, he was a professor at Dresden and, uh, and he immigrated first to Prague and then from uh, 38, if I remember well, to, 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 um, to England. Um, that's another example if you read the correspondent of the time, how these uh, artists had to fight to kind of really survive because nobody really wanted to, to buy their art anymore. They were declared degenerated in Germany, as you know, it, uh, from uh, 37. There was a big ex exhibition in Munich uh, on Arte uh, uh, and Arte de Kunst, which traveled all around in Germany. So, do, do you can you explain, for example, was there a special uh, exchange at that time in the end of the 30s between Kokoschka, his immigration to England, and your grandfather, or maybe Great Great Ring, who was in London? Why don't you answer yeah, that? Kokoschka, Kokoschka uh, there are these wonderful letters between my father and Kretering, and Kretering writes to him in the, in what, 38, I don't know the exact date, but before 39, that Kokoschka has just arrived from Prague. Probably he was running away from another woman, because that's where he usually changed the towns, but in fact it was just the opposite. His future, his wife-to-be, Olda, had just taken him and had told him, you have to leave Prague, you have to go to London. So he arrived with her, and she looked after him very much after that, uh, from that moment onwards. And he then uh, became quite, quite popular in London. He had friends there who, who asked him to do, do portraits and so on. But they had a very close relationship, not that they were any longer under contract. The contract only was renewed when my father had opened his business in 48 in Zurich. And then Kokoschka and my father reopened their contract that they had before the war until my father died in 1953. Then Kokoschka went to Marlboro, okay. which I rather resented. <laughs> Bon, donc je, je vois avancer le temps. Peut-être on va passer aussi la parole euh, au public. Donc euh, si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas. Comme ça, on peut profiter euh, du temps qui reste pour échanger avec nos, nos invités. Les micros sont là. Merci. 
Merci. Euh, je voudrais revenir sur, sur la question qu'a qu évoquée Inès euh, il y a quelques instants, euh, sur cette question de des ventes forcées, où, et vous avez répondu que finalement, euh, à cette époque-là, ou juste après la guerre, euh, on ne considérait, considérait pas ces, ces ventes euh, qu'il y a eu entre 33 et, et, et la guerre comme des ventes forcées, si, si, si j'ai bien compris, et de, pour le dire de façon générale. Aujourd'hui, c'est vrai qu'on a, je crois, quand même tendance à, à voir ça différemment. Il y a un certain nombre de, de dossiers qui sont ouverts en Europe, aux États-Unis, pour des demandes de restitution d'œuvres qui ont été vendues dans ces conditions par des personnes qui ont pu partir, quitter l'Allemagne et en vendant avant de partir ou après être parti pour financer leur, 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 leur exil. Et, et donc c'est évidemment très intéressant d'entendre votre... de vous entendre évoquer ce est, la façon dont c'était considéré à l'époque et comment voyez-vous aujourd'hui ces, ces demandes euh, donc de, de ces dernières années sur de, donc de gens qui... les familles qui reposent la question, euh, peut-être un, dans un état d'esprit différent et on a eu des cas en France aussi de, de restitution d'œuvres qui avaient été vendues par des personnes qui qui, qui avait été vendu en France, par exemple, en 1937, en 1938, une fois qu il, qu il, que ces personnes avaient quitté l'Allemagne pour financer leur, leur exil en France, en Angleterre ou, ou aux États-Unis. Donc, comment voyez-vous cela aujourd'hui Et est-ce que vous avez eu d'ailleurs des dossiers récemment euh, euh, ouverts ou réouverts euh, euh, à, à cause de ces nouvelles questions von damals wurde geschildert, wie ihr das heute einschätzt, also aus der heutigen Sicht, ob es für euh, 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 We, in, in Germany, the situation is, is very clear. There, now, there's, there's the, the attitude to say every sale between 1933 and 1945 has, is, has to be looked at and basically the, the work of art has to be returned if it was a Jewish uh, refugee. In Switzerland, this is not the case. And I feel it, that's the, the right way. I mean, anything sold in Germany is in Ger the German word is, is Raubkunst. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's stolen. The Fluchtkunst is something different. I mean, we have the same situation. The Le Linge, the, the example I, I, I mentioned, my grandfather, or we could have, we have been approached even by, by certain lawyers that we could um, reclaim certain works of art. And we don't do this. I mean, my father from the start, already my grandmother, I remember when I worked for Sotheby's in the late 90s and this whole issue started, my grandmother said she, she, the things she sold, she sold and she would never want them back. And of course we are coming from, from a family that is affected, that's our attitude and no, I, I wouldn't see it any different from, I mean, for me it's in a way it's also kind of respect to my grandfather, my grandmother, the things, the, the, the decisions they, they chose. I mean, she, from the point of view in the 90s, she said, no, she would never want anything returned. She thought it was the right thing to do. No, I wouldn't see it differently. <laughs> I'm always much more aggressive about this than my daughter is. And I am very, very sort of cross with certain groups of lawyers who are just out to make money with all this. And I, I really feel, uh, I don't know, I, I'm very emotional about that and I leave it to my daughter because of this to answer this question. <laughs> basically answer the qu I mean, that's what you feel too, right? Yeah, of I course, mean, of course, but... Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just extremely... We, there was, there was a, a, a very good symposium in Switzerland where there were German provenance research, researchers and Swiss provenance researchers, German lawyers and Swiss lawyers in Winterthur a couple of years ago. And it was quite clear that the Swiss provenance researchers and lawyers defend the, the, the Fluchtkunst aspect and say, we. we I mean, what Ines said before in, in respect of Westheim, they helped the refugees, they helped save the art. And um, it was the Germans who, you know, who threw the Jews out of the country and who stole, who, you know, who, who st 
stole everything. It, it's, we just can't compare the two in that, in that sense. Let me give you an example, which is the Cezanne of Gourlit, which was their most important picture. And it was absolutely clear that the Cezanne did not have to be returned to anybody because the family of Cezanne is not Jewish. But the fact that Gourlit stole this picture is absolutely clear to me. But Baron decided to come to an agreement with the Cezanne family that the picture would be their property, but it would be shown every year for several months in Aix-en-Provence. This is an, an agreement with the family Cezanne agreed on, and Bern also, and everybody is happy, and no money at changes hands. So nobody is earning some money on this deal, but everybody is happy. And that's what we should achieve. Oui, donc tu, ce que tu proposes, c'est en fait, si possible, de faire trouver un accord euh, entre, entre les différentes parties, ce qui n'est pas toujours évident, effectivement, s'il si y a déjà toute un, une mise en place euh, des avocats qui sont engagés, etc. Euh, D'autres questions en Silence. Peut-être juste aussi, encore pour revenir sur ce, ce, cette question-là, moi je pense que ce qui est très important du point de vue de la recherche, ce que vous avez, tu as très bien exposé aujourd'hui, c'est l'importance de contextualiser, c'est-à-dire de remettre euh, le débat aussi dans le contexte du temps. C'est-à-dire quand on regarde les sources de l'époque, on peut être, effectivement être parfois étonné de, de voir ces courriers, comme je l'ai cité, de, de Westheim, qui lui-même félicite donc, euh, Georg Schmidt pour, pour ses achats. Euh, c'est ça. Je pense qu'il faut, faut toujours relativiser, il faut essayer de comprendre qu'est-ce qui s'est passé à l'époque et est-ce que si on, même si on souhaite faire, refaire une justice qui évidemment est absolument impossible du point de vue d'aujourd'hui d'après tout ce qui s'est passé, euh, il faut peut-être aussi réfléchir et voir euh, en faisant peut-être une restitution, on peut aussi recréer une, une nouvelle injustice par rapport aux personnes qui effectivement au moment de, de, des faits ont agi et ont permis euh, la transaction des tableaux. Mais bon, ça c'est évidemment un débat et je pense aussi que ça dépend beaucoup de, de chaque cas. Ça dépend euh, aussi dans quelles conditions le transfert a eu lieu, est-ce que, est que les familles ont été payées ou pas. Donc euh, c'est ça peut-être la difficulté aussi de ne pas toujours avoir euh, tous les éléments pour comprendre la complexité de, du sujet. Mais j'aimerais bien quand même... Ah ouais, très bien, il y a encore une question. Yeah. Oh, you don't need one. Oui, parce qu'on a un enregistrement, donc c'est mieux. It's better because it's filmed. So, for the question. Thank you. So, my question is, can you uh, say a word about the situation in France at the time? Because France was occupied by the Germans, and what of the Jewish collectors in France, and uh, uh, were you able to help some of them um, with their art collections? Do you know, can you say anything about the situation in France? No, I can't really, because that is not the field of, of expertise. Or of, uh, my grandfather was mainly active for his clients from Amsterdam bringing their, their works either to Switzerland or to Holland and then sending them on to, no, I'm afraid, not really. Mais est-ce qu'on peut pas dire qu'il y a eu, je, je rebondis sur ce que tu disais Inès, est-ce qu'on peut pas dire qu'il y a eu plus de marchands et de collectionneurs juifs avisés euh, en Allemagne des 33 euh, que en France euh, sur la période de disons 38-40 Enfin, avant l'invasion, et qu'il y a quand même, on a l'impression à, à vous y entendre, qu'il y a eu, euh, bon, il y a, il y a eu, des, il y a eu des, des spoliations opérées par les nazis, c'est sûr en Allemagne, mais il y a eu aussi des, des procédures, des mesures de protection qui ont été prises euh, de façon euh, quand même très, très, très sérieuse et très structurée par des marchands et des, des collectionneurs en Allemagne, beaucoup plus qu'en France, où il y a eu une, un aveuglement quand même monstrueux 
des, mais pas seulement des collectionneurs et des marchands juifs, enfin du, du pays tout entier, euh, par rapport au, au danger qui, qui pesait. Et je, je, ce, je, ce qui est très intéressant, c'est de, de, de voir les, les, les procédures de, de protection, de, de mise à l'abri qui ont été prises euh, principalement auprès du, du, de, de Zurich et de Bâle euh, par un certain nombre de marchands et de collectionneurs. En France, les, les, enfin, on sait ce qui s'est passé, c'est les musées nationaux qui ont mis les, les tableaux des collections privées à Chambord et on sait ce qui s'y est passé ensuite. Donc c'est intéressant de voir ça. De, 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 bon, c'est sûr que les marchands, les collectionneurs allemands avaient le nazisme sous le nez, mais quand on lit la presse, on se rend compte que, enfin quand on lit la presse, quand on lit les courriers, on se rend compte que, on savait très bien ce qui se passait en Allemagne. C'est étonnant de voir à quel point il y a eu cet aveuglement en France. C'est pour ça que je rebondis sur la, la question. Enfin, C'est étonnant de voir ça. Voilà, C'est tout. C'est une remarque en passant. Fait. Merci. On sait que, les, que des, des marches en Suisse euh, sont venues à Paris pour acheter pendant cette, cette année. Mais mon père n'a pas pu se faire parce que... Les... Ce n'était pas possible de quitter la Suisse pendant la guerre, pour lui, parce qu'il n'avait pas de passeport. Hello, good evening. I must say I'm totally unfamiliar with your family and your family's history, but I'm a little bit more familiar with the case of Goudsticker, Goldsticker, the ancient, mainly Dutch art during the war. And obviously, uh, this Flugkunst and uh, Raubkunst, each case is different. And I think it's pretty normal. And over, obviously, nowadays, 75 years after the war, the, f the, f the feelings are different. But those peoples, those families, uh, those members who survived the war, just thanks or due to selling a painting. In those, in those days, what was a painting by Manet or Cézanne, and what was the cost of it? Not that much, you know. So obviously, they would not complain about the handling of it whatsoever, because they survived the war as many millions did not. So that's quite obvious. But I know cases even nowadays of. Uh, uh, let's say, of, uh, of children, grandchildren, uh, uh, whereby the works of art in museums are still difficult to get back or to know what happened because they were not of the allure of Cézanne or so, but still, you know, but I must say every case is different. But it's very it's better, subtle ma matter, and obviously we're not talking about the many works that were uh, confiscated, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 which belong to people who did not survive the wars, and all, even those who had children or grandchildren, that you know, yeah, uh, no restitution were pay was paid for those who, sur the few who survived the camps. So what are we talking about, you know, works of art? Uh, the same thing for violence, you know, my uh, second father bought a Warnieri in the early 60s for $43,000. Nothing nowadays, it's worth millions and millions, you know? So let's say times have changed the, our attitude and our feelings about material things, you know? That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. No, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, every single case has to be looked at, at individually. I mean, that is also the issue with provenance research. You cannot, you know, basically give a rule for everything. I absolutely agree. And I mean, what I was talking about were the clients of, I really, it's a very um, unique situation. It would, it, they were the clients of my grandfather. And I am just trying to make a statement of how this particular situation was, but I 
completely agree with you. I mean, there are many cases where, you know, provenance where work of art has absolutely has to be returned. I mean, you know, there's no question about it. And and where if if if, if you know something if something was stolen and and and, and lost, of, of course. And they and again, I always also really emphasize this because I find that it can't be emphasized enough. Every single case, every single picture has to be researched individually because otherwise you can never make a sort of big general decision that is impossible. Oui, si, si vous permettez aussi, ça, ça, ça nous rappelle en fait le, la séance qu'on a eue ici en février. C'était justement aussi l'intérêt de ce séminaire, c'est d'ouvrir le débat, de, 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 de recevoir en fait des différents témoignages, des différentes positions. Et justement en février, on a eu l'exemple de, de Viviane Dreyfus donc, euh, qui, qui a reçu, en fait c'était une première institution euh, proactive de l'État français euh, par rapport à un dessin de dégâts de qu'elle qu a reçu, euh, qui a appartenait à son père et qui a été retrouvé en fait dans l'ambassade de l'Allemagne après la guerre et qui n'est pas reconnu, enfin on n'avait pas fait le lien avec, avec sa famille. Donc là c'était un témoignage extrêmement important et très euh, plein d'émotions et on a vu à quel point un retour, une restitution euh, peut avoir son importance effectivement comme vous dites pour, pour les familles, pour les descendants. Donc, je pense que je suis entièrement d'accord avec euh, avec Christina, que l'importance de, de l'étude très spécifique, cas par cas, euh, simplement ce que je pense qu'on voulait un petit peu vous montrer ce soir aussi, c'était euh, ce débat qui, qui, quand même, qui a une grande actualité, parce que je pense que notamment en France, là je regarde David TV, euh, on, va, on va devoir prendre une position euh, très claire par rapport à ces questions-là, et que là on a eu ce témoignage, et, et peut-être aussi la, la mise en en avant de, de l'importance de, de, de faire ces différences entre, entre Flur Kunz et Raub Kunz, et que, voilà, que chacun n'est pas pareil, et qu'il y a eu aussi beaucoup de transferts qui ont justement permis de, à la fois, aider, aider les familles et, et sauver, sauver l'art. Est-ce qu'il reste d'autres questions Je regarde la, la montre, il nous reste quelques petites minutes. Non bah, bah écoutez, s'il n'y si a plus de questions, je vous remercie beaucoup pour votre intérêt et, et je vous dis euh, bon, la prochaine séance le 1er avril avec euh, Sébastien Lallard, donc, qui est le directeur du département peinture du Louvre et aussi un collègue du musée euh, de Mannheim qui a fait toute une euh, mise en scène, une exposition par rapport à cette problématique et par rapport à l'histoire de son musée euh, à Mannheim. Donc euh, j'espère vous revoir le, le 1er avril. Merci beaucoup. Bonne soirée.